The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Daniel Fusco Ministries. Hey everyone, my name is Daniel Fusco and welcome to today's Real Show. I love getting to be a pastor, but I'm not only a full-time pastor. I love to say that I'm also a full-time dad. I got these three great kids, Obadiah, Maranoth, and Annabelle. I totally love them. They're great kids. Now, I also grew up all Italian from New Jersey and I was a wild kid. So that means I've had my fair share of scrapes and also unfortunately near death experiences. Now it's one thing to go through it yourself, but it's actually really bad to watch someone else go through it, especially my kids. This just happened to us a few months back. Our youngest Annabelle, she loves to have fun. She was playing with her friend Sophia. and Sophia was jumping off this bleacher, but Sophia is a little older than Annabelle. Sophia made the jump, no problem. Annabelle, she missed a jump, she landed on her chin, blood was everywhere. She ended up with six stitches. I mean, you can imagine the scene, crying. We had to take her to the hospital. It was a horrible experience. But what the thing is, is that standing on the outside, it's one thing if it happens to me, I can handle it. But when it happens to someone I love, it's horrible. Now here's the thing, all of us know people who are making decisions that are self-destructive, that were the decision that they're making is literally destroying their own life. And what's amazing is, it's very easy if you're standing aside to pass judgment on that person. But here's the thing, the same thing happens for us spiritually, and the same thing happens in that classic parable of the prodigal son. What we learn is that the father loves to invite people home no matter how far they've run. Now, I love hearing from people just like you who are like, I've never watched a religious program before, and definitely not one with a guy with dreadlocks. Listen. Join me on this journey. There is something for each one of us to learn because we've all been lost and God wants to find each one of us. So let's get real on today's program. I realize as I've gotten older that, you know, Jesus has a tremendous way of being subtle sometimes. He's not always subtle, but when subtlety is needed, Jesus has this tremendous ability to bring a subtle distinction out in such a way that was, is absolutely necessary. And I want to show you one of those today. So I want you to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 15. We're going to be taking verses 11 to 32. This is the famed parable of the prodigal son. Chapter 15 begins with the Pharisees and, 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 the, and, the, and the scribes, and they're complaining about who Jesus keeps company with. He keeps company with the riffraff of that society. Now, I want to just break this open for you. Look what it says in verse 11. It says this. It says, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his livelihood, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living, or the word prodigal means wasteful or excessive. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And then he went, and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine, and he would gladly had filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. For I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. Now stop right there. See, this is the story of the, the prodigal son. Now, really what goes on here is this son, he's living in his father's house and this Father has two sons. So the one son, he goes to his dad. He says, dad, will you give me my inheritance now? So really what the son is saying is, dad, I don't want to have anything to do with you because getting your inheritance before somebody passes away is not exactly normal, right? So he's coming and saying, look, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Can I get the money now? And the father decides, yes, you can. And he gives his son and the son decides to take it. And he goes to a far country and he lives excessively or prodigally. I'll say it to you this way. That you and I, we can get lost when we leave and we squander. 
We get, we get lost when we leave and we squander. See, this son, he decides he does not want to be in his father's house anymore. He doesn't want to be under his father's authority. So he leaves him. And what's amazing is, is even though he leaves his father, his father has still bestowed upon him all that he needs. But you leave, and then when you leave the presence of the father, you end up squandering what the father has given you. Now, this is a beautiful example of the tax collectors and sinners that Jesus is advocating for to the Pharisees because the problem for those people is that God had blessed them. He gave them breath in their lungs. He knit them together fearfully and wonderfully in his mother's womb. He gave them gifts and talents and intelligence and all these things that somebody has, but they decide, I don't want to be in my father's house. So you leave in the house of God, you leave an understanding of God, and then you begin to live in a way that you may not realize it, but it's excessive or wasteful. Whenever you leave the presence of God and you steward what God has entrusted to you in a way that is not in lines with what the Father would have, you are living in a wasteful way. And it happens because first you choose to leave the presence of your heavenly father. And then second, by being away from him, you ultimately squander what he's entrusted to you. Where you use the gifts and talents that he's given you, but you use them for other means. Now, I look at my own life and I see this in my own life. Because again, like I grew up in an amazing family, but we, didn't, we weren't walking with Jesus. And so very quickly as a young person with gifts and talents and issues and all those things, I didn't have any idea that there was a father's house to live in. So I, I left this presence and then I did with whatever I wanted to do. So, you know, um, I, I have a big mouth and I could use my big mouth for lots of things. And I've done a lot of things with my big mouth. And listen, to some of you right now, this is where you are. You have received gifts and talents, all sorts of things from the Lord, but you have left his presence and now you're, squan you're, you're squandering it with wasteful living. Now what goes on for this guy is him squandering his resources, that was his fault. But then you couple on it some situations that were outside of his control, what ended up happening was is he squandered it and then he walked right into a famine. So he lost everything he had and now there's external circumstances that are now pressing in. There's a severe famine in the land and what you end up finding is now he's in want. And so what this young man who's been having such a great time leave out of his father's house, have life of the party, everything he needs, now he's in want and nobody can help him because there's a famine. So what he ends up doing is he links himself up to a man who herded or, or shepherded, so to speak, pigs. Now, for a young Jewish man, this was the worst job ever. Pigs in that culture were considered unclean. You know, and if you like bacon, you just thank Jesus for the Jerusalem council every single day. You know, you don't, it, it, you'll get it later. Just write that down. Just you write it down, you get it later. You know, and, and so... What ended up going on is for this young man, he's in such want that he's not only feeding pigs, which was completely a detestable vocation for him, but he's looking at the, the pods that the pigs would eat and he's lusting after that food. And listen, this shows what happens when we get away from the Lord long enough and we squander what he's given us enough. We begin to desire pig's food. And unfortunately, some of us know what this is like. But then all of a sudden, notice what it says, verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father's house and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. See, all of a sudden he came to himself. Now listen, I think there's some of you right now, you're coming to yourself right as you hear that. You're like, that's you right now. You're looking at your life and you're looking at the things that you desire and you're saying, I am desiring pig's food right now. And right now, in this moment, you realize that in your heavenly Father's house, there is more than enough. And even though you've made a ton of mistakes, you know that in your Father's house, there's grace and there's blessing and there's forgiveness. And I'm here to tell you, you need to come to yourself and you need to decide to come home. Now, what I think is beautiful is he begins to rehearse his speech. Father, notice he says, I've sinned. 
against heaven and before you. I've sinned against God and I've sinned in your sight. Now this is powerful because this is what sin really does. Really you sin against God and then you sin in the presence of people, right? When you realize that God is a holy God and a perfect God, you sin against God first and then because you sin against God, you sin in the presence of people. King David said almost the same thing. Psalm 51 verses one to four. When he realized what he had done, this is what he says. This is after his sin with Bathsheba. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness and according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me against you. You only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Here's the thing, my friend. If you just stole from your parents, you sinned before your parents, but you really sinned against God. And your parents are getting the brunt of that. See, it's always vertical first. It's always about God first. And when you realize, see, this young man has good theology. He's like, I've sinned against heaven, against God. And I've sinned before the eyes of my father by wasting what he's entrusted to me. See, this is, you get lost when you leave and you squander. Because your life is about you stewarding the gifts that God has given you. So he decides he's going to go home. Now, look at what happens, middle of verse 20. It says, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, I am no longer to be worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here to kill it and let us eat and be merry for my son who is dead is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Here's the thing. Your return is embraced and celebrated. Your return is embraced and celebrated. See, this is that, this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees about the people who were the riffraff. He's saying, listen, you get lost when you leave and squander, but when you come back... You are embraced and celebrated. See, Jesus is saying, you guys don't realize you've missed the very heart of God. Why? Because these tax collectors, sinners, they're coming back and I am embracing them and I'm celebrating the fact that they are interested in the kingdom of God again. See, this young man does not even get his whole speech out. See, this picture of while he was afar off, you get the picture in your mind of the father every evening sitting on the front porch of his house, looking onto the horizon, waiting for his son to come home. I know many of you who have prodigals, you know exactly what that's like. You're just waiting for the phone to ring. You're just waiting for a text message to come. You're just waiting for that child to show back up again. And this father, when he sees him at a distance, he gets up, he runs to him. In that culture, dads didn't run. Look at how the father responds here. And this is very, very much the heart of God. Because notice what he says. For this, my son was dead and is alive again, verse 24. He was lost and is found. So they made Mary. See, he never stopped being the father's son, even though he was jacked up and messed up, even though he was squandering everything, even though he didn't want to be in the father's house, he never stopped being that father's son. And that's the father heart of God, my friends. If you're away from him, if you are lost because you have left his presence, you never stopped being someone who God cares about. And when you come back, God's like, listen, let's talk about everything that just went on. And, and, and dude, have you learned your lesson? No. The simple fact that you are home brings joy to the father's heart. But here's the thing. The son had to come home. No doubt the father tried to find out about the son, but it was about the son coming home. Now listen, you know what coming home is called in the Bible? It's called repentance. Listen to what it says. Acts chapter three, verse 19. Repent therefore, which means turn back. That's what repentance means. Turn back and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. See, when that son, he remembered. See, re repentance is not what saves you. Jesus saves you. But repentance is what we do when we respond to Jesus and we embrace what Jesus has done. See, notice, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out that you may 
so that times of refreshing may come to the Lord. See, the son returned, right? And he came back to his father's house that these times of refreshing may come because the father is simply happy. So Jesus is saying, listen, when someone who's lost, when someone who's lived prodigally and squandered, when they come back, a dad rejoices. So he's saying, your issues right now are unfounded. That's what he's telling the, the Pharisees. And if, listen, I just want to say this. If, if you're here today, you're hearing this, whether on TV, radio, wherever you're hearing this, listen, if you have left the presence of God and you're squandering all that God has entrusted you, listen, all you need to do is return. He invites you to return. Now, but that's only part of the story. Now, here's where you have that subtle shift of Jesus. Because Jesus has been dealing with the tax collectors and sinners in the eyes of the Pharisees. But look at what happens next. Look at verse 25. Now his older brother was in the field and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he, speaking of the older brother, was angry and would not go in. And therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. And so he answered and he said to his father, lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Now, you know what's amazing? This parable isn't about the prodigal son. It's actually the parable of the two lost sons. Because here's what you get now. We also get lost when we stay, but we miss. We get lost when we stay, but miss. And when I say but miss, see, you know what the problem with the older brother is? He never left. He stayed, but he missed the father's heart. See, now Jesus turns, now this parable is about the Pharisees. He's like, you know what your problem is? You're like the older brother. He's like, you have always stayed in the house of God. You have devoted your life to following the law, the Torah. You have done everything. You are the gold standard of how to be a religious person, but you miss the very heart of your father whose house you live in. But the father, I, I, the picture of the father is amazing. He went out to go greet the prodigal son who's returning. Now he's got to go out and he's got to meet with the self-righteous religious brother who won't come into the party. Brothers and sisters, listen, if you ever doubted that God is a God on the move, this parable reminds us God's always been a missionary God. God, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God went after them. Jesus came because God is a missionary God. Because God is interested in seeking the lost. Jesus didn't say, listen, I'm going to do this from heaven. He came to earth. And listen, Jesus comes after you. Now, if you are the prodigal, he runs and he embraces you. But listen, for many of us in church, we got to be honest. This is some of us. See, the problem with this older brother is first, he thinks God doesn't take care of him. Right? Because he feels that he hasn't been given what he's ever. Here's what I'll tell you. You know you're self-righteous when you feel like people aren't treating you the way that you deserve to be treated. When you feel like you're not getting treated or getting the, what you deserve, that's where you can see the self-righteousness in your life, right? And then he says, he, he doesn't even realize, see, what happens, this is how Satan uses religion. He makes you think that those people are not part of what God may wanna do, right? It's, it's a depersonalization of a group of people. Now, listen, the body of Christ does this really good still today, doesn't it? You think that someone, because of something, can never be the recipient of God's grace. They've made too many mistakes. And I'm here to tell you, the Bible teaches, I'll read it to you, Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourself, it's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. You wanna hear the good news of Jesus? Doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter what your background is, doesn't matter what your habits are. If you come to Jesus, Jesus has already taken 
that punishment for that sin on the cross in his own body, that no matter how you come to him, he will forgive you with all that you are and that he will transform your life without any qualifications. But notice how this chapter closes, this story closes, and it's such a beautiful place for us to to take this message and bring it to a perfect little closing. It says this in verse 31. And he said to him, this is the father's son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. Brothers and sisters, you must remember who he is. You must remember who he is. See, what's going on here is Jesus is trying to tell the Pharisees, listen. He's like, know what the problem is? You've forgotten who the father is. You've forgotten his character. Because notice, just as the prodigal son, when he came back all disheveled and beat up, my son, who was dead, is alive again. Now he goes to the older brother who's so angry at his father for celebrating the return of his brother who got messed up. Notice the first word, son. I, I, the, the father's heart here is so powerful because his response is tender still. No biases. He's like, whether you're my strung out prodigal who's gone or whether you're my self-righteous religious person who's close in the father's heart they're both the sons son you are always with me and all that I have is yours I mean, think about what he's saying he's like look my son you're always in my presence and you don't even realize the privileges that I've entrusted to you and listen for those of you here today who've been following Jesus for a long time and I know there's a lot of us here don't ever forget the privileges that you have of being a child of God. You're always with him and all that he has is ours. Think of, the book of Ephesians says that we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. What are you complaining about? What, what, what's making you sad? What do you feel like? God isn't taking care of me. He's given you everything you need for life and godliness in Christ. It's all yours. It's always been yours in Christ. But notice what he says. Not only do you have all these immense privileges, he says, it was right that we should make Mary and be glad. And that word in the Greek where it says it was right, the thrust of it in the in the. The verb tense is, it was necessary. Not that it was the right, it was like, it was absolutely necessary that we celebrate. Why? Because your brother who was lost, he got found. Your brother was dead, he's alive again. He's back in our home. And you know what's amazing about this chapter? And I'm gonna leave this right here. You notice it doesn't actually tell us what the Pharisees do. It's like, it's left open-ended. It's like, you, like, there's that part of you wants to be like, okay, so like the camera pulls to the Pharisees and they start to be like, oh God, I've missed this. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I've missed your heart. But it actually doesn't say anything. The story just ends. And the question for me, for us as a church family, for the Crossroads family, for people all over the globe who are watching this is this, how do you respond how are you gonna respond? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? And listen, even though there's multiple ways to be lost, don't ever miss the fact that God always comes to find what's lost, whether it's the religious older brother or it's the prodigal who strayed, the father's heart is always to go find what's lost. So we're at the moment in the program where a decision has to be made. Now, listen, every thing that you do begins with a decision that you make. Everything that you've ever experienced, a decision was made that led you there. And here's the thing, no matter where you are on your faith journey, Jesus is inviting each one of us to let him transform our lives. And there are many of you right now 
maybe you've been thinking about Jesus, or you've been wondering about Jesus. It's, but it's one thing to do that. It's another thing to say, Jesus, I want you to transform my life. And the way that we do that is by what the Bible calls being born again, where we respond to Jesus by surrendering our lives to him, by receiving his grace, by declaring that he is the Messiah, God's promised one. And I believe that for many of you, a lot of things have been leading up to this moment, and today is the day that you make that decision. So if that's you, if you're making that decision, and I hope that many of you are, I want you to just pray this prayer. So repeat this prayer after me as we bow our heads in our hearts. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for saving me. I believe in you, your life, your death on the cross, and your resurrection. Forgive me of my sins and fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So you just said yes to Jesus, and I want to get resources in your hands, but I can only do that if I know about it. So pull out your mobile phone, text the word SAVED, S-A-V-E-D, to 51400. And my team's going to get in touch with you and fill out that information so we can get resources in your hands that will help you on this journey. But don't go anywhere. I got a big idea that I want you to hear. You can take part in the amazing work God is doing through the powerful message that, although life is messy, Jesus is real. By partnering with Daniel Fusco Ministries, you help make programs like this available to people who may not otherwise experience the love and hope only found in Jesus. With your regularly scheduled partnership, your generosity can help transform lives forever. Go to danielfusco.com partner now and become a part of the Daniel Fusco Ministry support team with your regularly scheduled or one-time gift. Be the hands and feet of Jesus in your world and become a partner today. So we're just about out of time on today's program, but I'd love to get to connect with you. Check out my website, danielfusco.com, and make sure you sign up for the weekly newsletter. People love the newsletter. We tell powerful stories of life transformation, and we all want our lives to be transformed. Also, thank you for your partnership, for praying for this program. Also, if you go to danielfusco.com slash partner, we want to go on more stations, reach more people with a simple message that Jesus is real. I love social media. You love social media. Find me at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, you name it, I'm there. And I would love for you to join me at Crossroads. So many people watch this show. Also join the Crossroads Internet Campus at crossroadslive.tv. Or if you're in the Vancouver, Washington area, come see us at our campus. Okay, here's our big idea for this week. It's time to come home. Your Father in heaven is ready to embrace you and celebrate you. So listen, never forget, although life is messy, Jesus is real, and he loves us even in the midst of our messy lives. God bless you. I'll see you soon. Jesus is